From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Arizona's Republican gubernatorial nominee Carrie Lake refuses to concede as the Supreme Court says it will take up a case on President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. Welcome. I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnist Kim Strassel and editorial board member Colin Levy. Welcome and happy Friday to one and all. Nearly a month after the November election, the results in Arizona are being certified, and they show that Carrie Lake lost the governor's race by more than 17,000 votes. The recount margin in Arizona is half a percentage point, and Lake lost by seven-tenths of a point, so it's not even close enough to go to an automatic recount. But this week, Carrie Lake called the election a sham and more. Listen to this. Maricopa County, where it took two weeks to count, is the poster child for broken, botched elections. But if you bring up any of these issues, you are labeled an election denier or a conspiracy theorist. They don't want us talking about our shoddy elections under any circumstances. They shut us down and made us fear exercising our freedom of speech, and they canceled anyone who questioned past elections. Because of that, many Americans did not speak out and nothing was done to shore up elections. And now we are paying the price again. Kim, what do you make of this? I suppose probably not unexpected given what Carrie Lake had already said during the campaign about the 2020 election and President Trump's loss. Yeah, it's disappointing. I mean, and let's be clear here. There were certainly some problems on Election Day in Arizona, in particular in Maricopa, where there was a problem with some printers and the ballots turned out to be too light to be read by the tabulation machines. And that caused lines to back up. There was also some issues about counted and uncounted ballots getting mixed. And it was concerning enough that even the attorney general of the state, Mark Brnovich, who has been very good on elections issues, has certainly not bought into any election denialism, but he did ask for some answers. But the reality is, is the county has given some pretty good ones, noting that yeah, there were some places where vote lines were longer, but that they have been through everything and that they are absolutely caught that their counts are correct. Overall, too, look, Hobbs won by 17,000 votes. It was not even in the half percentage that you need to trigger a recount. Most of the counties have certified their results. There were not problems in most places. And I think it would be incumbent upon Lake to make something more than just a vague accusation that there is a problem here. And that's her issue is she doesn't have anything more than vague allegations. I can do a little bit of a deep dive into what happened in Maricopa County because I spent a lot of time this week looking into that. So Maricopa County, unlike a lot of places in the United States, you're not locked into a precinct. Most voters in most places where I go to vote in New Jersey, you have to go to your specific precinct because that's where they have the ballots for all of the local races, for the correct district, for the correct dog catcher. And what Arizona does is different. They have 223 vote centers in Maricopa County. Any voter can go to any vote center And given the number of different local races, different dog catchers on the ballot that exist, the practical result of that is they have to print ballots on demand. So you go to any vote center, you get a ballot printed on demand, you fill it out, and then they have on-site tabulators. And as Kim says, there were problems with some of the printers that meant they were not feeding into the tabulators and being read correctly. And so obviously that's a problem. I think Maricopa County should reckon with that and promise that they're going to figure out what happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. They have said that everyone who wanted to cast a ballot had an opportunity to do so. And while that's true, I can also understand the argument that there were people who were looking at some of these lines and saying, you know, maybe I don't really have time in my workday to go to vote and cast a ballot like I intended to. On the other hand, given the vote center model, I think there were also a lot of people who saw the line and thought, well, I think there's another vote center three or four miles down the road. Maybe I'll go to that one. I'll look up the wait time online. So what happens in Arizona is that you feed the ballot into the tabulator and it falls into the box. It looks kind of like a big Rubbermaid. And if there's something wrong, whether it's the printer or the tabulator, something's not working, there's a divider in the box and there's a separate slot marked with a number three And if you're having a problem scanning, you can put your ballot into this number three slot and it will be kept separately and it will be tallied later at the central count location. 
And part of the problem in Arizona and Maricopa County was that there were conspiratorial Republicans, including the chairwoman of the Arizona Republican Party, who was saying, do not put your ballot into box three. And so that also contributed to the chaos because there were people who were being told by the party that they support not to follow the instructions of the people at the polling place. And so this is another example of a place where I think these conspiracies end up rebounding and hurting Republicans. I think that was true in 2020 with President Trump, too. Some of his advisors were saying these vote by mail rules are here and Republicans got to figure out how to make the best use of them. And he essentially refused to do that. Yeah, there's there's no question that the Republicans did themselves a disservice there. And honestly, those sorts of things can streamline the process. When you look at the lines that happened at the ballot boxes in Arizona, I think <laughs> it's sort of like a line at the doctor's office. It just sort of generally reduces your confidence in the competence of the system, right? But that doesn't mean that there's anything actually bad going on there. It just gives the impression that the state was not as on top of its game as it otherwise might have been. I think the real issue here as we look at this race is that we're starting to see this habit of Republicans challenging, just kind of throwing all the spaghetti at the wall, all the charges to see, you know, what could stick here. And so the idea that simultaneously, you know, trying to undermine the idea that Katie Hobbs, uh, because she's secretary of state, that somehow that was undermining the election because it was a conflict of interest or for her. And, you know, and then you have the things at the ballot box. It all sort of goes into the impression that uh, we're making a bit of an industry of challenging elections. And that's something that really worried me looking at this, because just like coming out of the 2020 election challenges, you're starting to get this industry of lawyers that just are going to hop state to state and look for ways to find fraud or find inaccuracies or find, you know, any errors, whether or not the margin is even particularly close. As we've seen, it wasn't particularly a razor thin margin in Arizona. But I don't like that. It reminds me of the trial lawyers that go profiteering, looking for companies to sue. And, and then that's their business. And if they can't find one that actually did something wrong, then they'll just kind of make it up as they go along. A couple other things I would add is just that the Washington Post did an analysis of the precincts where there were printer issues and said that there were 37 percent Republican voters versus 35 percent for the county overall. And some of the precincts that were affected were heavily Democratic precincts. Kim, you mentioned there was some commingling of counted and uncounted ballots. So what the county says is there was one location where the box three ballots, the workers there didn't keep them separate from the ballots that had already gone through the tabulator. And then there was a location where the divider that was supposed to be in the box was not there. And so those were commingled. And one of the people at the Maricopa County canvassing said, you can't take the salt out of the soup. And the response by the county was, well, actually, you can, because what we do is we just rerun, we zero out the tabulator and we retabulate everything that was in the box. And so whether they were tabulated or not the first time, if you do all the ballots that are in the box in one batch, you get everything without any threat of anything being double counted. Just to provide some numbers, there were 16,700 roughly ballots that ended up in this box three There were about 200 voters who checked in at one voting site and then decided they wanted to go try to cast a ballot at another voting site. And these are in the context, again, of Cary Lake losing the election statewide by 17,000 votes. The other thing, Kim, that I think is worth pointing out is there were Republicans who won, including in Maricopa County. There was a local prosecutor, Rachel Mitchell, who got 23,900 more votes than Cary Lake did. The Republican House candidates in Maricopa County got about 40,000 more votes than Carrie Lake did. And there's a state treasurer, Kimberly Yee, who got about 77,000 more votes in Maricopa County than Carrie Lake did. So to me, if you look at these figures, the obvious conclusion is that the result for Carrie Lake was split ticket voting. There were Republicans who saw that she had called John McCain a loser and had talked about these 2020 fraud theories and said, I don't want to elect that person as my governor. Right. And I think that those numbers you cited about how far behind she ran other Republican candidates are the most damning case against her claims now that there was some sort of shenanigans because it makes absolutely no intellectual sense that you would have these voting machines or some nefarious plot that would allow every other Republican win and somehow only penalize 
analyze Carrie Lake. It suggests that the machines were working exactly as they were. And as you said, the problem was that she was a very controversial figure who had said very controversial things. She was also very telegenic. And I think that that is really what floated her campaign to the degree it was. But in the end, you had Arizona voters. And they are a slightly different kind of electorate. The state has trended Republican. But as you mentioned, this is a state that elected John McCain as our senator for many years. They have a slightly different view on civility and politics in particular, if I could sum up a lot of the electorate there, in particular, their swing voters. And she certainly rubbed people the wrong way. One last thing I just would mention here about how damaging a lot of these claims are, just to add to what Colin was saying, is that, you know, we had one county out in Arizona, Cochise County, and I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but it refused for a number of days to certify its election revolts. This is a Republican-leaning county, and there were all of these theories that there were problems with the vote counting machines. They were overwrought, but it did cause the GOP Board of Supervisors there to say that they were not going to certify the election. And one of the consequences of that would have been that if their votes had not been counted, some 47,000 of them, it would have disenfranchised those voters. But it also would have changed the results in a House seat that Republicans had won, also a state schools chief that Republican candidates had won. So it would have been very damaging to the Republican Party if this is what had transpired in the end. Now, they have indeed certified their results, so that is no longer an issue. But it's an example of of some of the corrosive and unattended consequences that can come when you have these theories floating around. And my last thought here is that doesn't mean that there's no reforms that can be done. I certainly think that Maricopa County should, over the next year or two before the next election, provide an explanation and how they're going to make sure this printer problem is not going to happen again. And by the way, there the slow counting in Arizona is also an issue that I think is corrosive to trust some of that, the local Republican recorder in Maricopa County has said is due to the fact that Arizona lets people drop off mail ballots on Election Day and then they're not allowed to go collect those ballots from the polling locations until the polls close. And so they ended up with hundreds of thousands of votes that they had to do signature verification on and so forth after the fact. And maybe that's a policy choice that Arizona should go the other direction and not let hundreds of thousands of people drop off those mail votes on Election Day. 